uh, like to get this show on the road. Very important show if you're interested in Africa and its future and investment, which, as I've said earlier to some of you uh, moving around here, my children who are born and bred in Africa, their future relies a lot on what's said here today. My name's Chris Bishop. I'm the founding editor of Forbes Africa magazine. We started six years ago this month, and uh, we've become the biggest and fastest growing business magazine on the African continent. We uh, have more than 200,000 readers every month, and one of the key things in our magazine is entrepreneurs. We are unearthing African entrepreneurs every month. It's a very important story for us. A lot of people uh, said, say to me, like, oh, we didn't know there were so many entrepreneurs in Africa. Believe me, every month we're finding more and more. But welcome to this uh, forum here in Brussels. Uh, let's hope we all take away something useful from this that we can use in our, our future lives and business. But first, let's just hear from some of the key speakers here. And if I could introduce the first speaker onto the stage, Mr. Nevin Mimika, the Commissioner in Charge of International Cooperation and Development, the European Union. So, very good morning, Excellencies, distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen. I have the great pleasure to welcome you all here to the EU Africa Business Forum. This is the latest milestone in a series of uh, events leading to the fifth Africa EU Summit in Abidjan at the end of November. Indeed, 2017 will be a defining year for Africa EU relations. Now, more than ever, we need to build a stronger partnership between Africa and Europe for greater prosperity and stability on both of our continents and to increase our cooperation in the international arena. Just last month, the European Commission, together with the High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, made our contribution to a renewed impetus of the Africa-EU partnership in the run-up to the Abidjan summit. It is not a new EU strategy, but a basis for discussion. It suggests the areas and initiatives which, are, which uh, we think can have the biggest impact on delivering the global 2030 agenda and Africa's agenda 2063. In particular, it identifies two main strengths of work, building more resilient states and societies, and creating more quality jobs, particularly for young people. Investing in youth is indeed the overarching theme of the Abidjan Summit, and this will require innovative approaches to ensure that the concerns and aspirations of young people in Africa and Europe are heard and that they are actively involved in designing the solutions. We want to make sure that the Africa-EU summit goes beyond warm declarations to define a solid set of deliverables. And this will need the ownership and involvement of all. This is where mechanisms like the EU Africa Business Forum are so important. This forum provides a platform for us in public institutions to engage with business representatives from both continents in an open and frank discussion on how to better address our common challenges. In line with this year's European Development Days and our recent proposals, we want to focus today on how to boost investments and unleash the potential for decent job creation. Why does this matter? We are all aware that the demographic dynamics in Africa will be one of the most significant global challenges of the 21st century. More than a half of the total population growth until 2050 is expected to take place in Africa. 
by which time it will be the only region in the world to have a population younger than it is today. According to IMF projections, Sub-Saharan Africa will need to create 18 million additional jobs each year up to 2025, sorry, to 20, uh, 2035, and to keep pace with the number of new job seekers entering the market. This compares to only 3 million formal jobs created today on a yearly basis. The European Union is currently Africa's number one investor, its largest trading partner, and the first source of remittances. But we can do even more and better together. This includes turning Africa's demographic challenges into a dividend, not a burden, by offering real opportunities to this vibrant young workforce. This population boom is also expected to generate significant market opportunities with private consumption driven by an expanding middle class projected to reach 2 trillion euros annually in 2025. Companies in Africa are expected to create an even larger market with an additional 3.3 trillion euros in spending projected for the same uh, time scale. Making the most of this demographic dividend will require, first and foremost, growth that is inclusive and sustainable. Growth that is based on value-adding diversified economic activities in key sectors such as agribusiness, sustainable energy, and digital technologies. All this requires investment. Investment in people through better education and vocational training. Investment in business by creating the right conditions and climate for entrepreneurs to flourish. And investment by the public and private sector to diversify economies and link them to regional and global value chains. In order to support this, the European Union is working on an ambitious European external investment plan to help boost investment for sustainable development in so-called riskier areas and sectors in Africa. We want to generate investment of up to 44 billion euros or even more if other partners contribute. And we would like to work closely with European and international financial institutions, including the European Investment Bank and the African Development Bank, as we have done in the past under similar investment facilities. It is the same logic that works well for the internal European investment plan, using public funding as a catalyst to attract public and private investment and to create jobs. And it is the natural evolution of the blending instruments that we are using for almost 10 years in our development cooperation. This new plan is based on three pillars. Firstly, a new guarantee and other financial risk sharing mechanisms. Secondly, technical assistance to build a better pipeline of bankable projects. And thirdly, policy reforms and dialogue with the private sector to improve the overall investment climate in partner countries. The message we frequently get is that money is not always the real or only issue. In fact, improving the conditions for investments is more important in reducing the risks to acceptable levels. This is why I'm happy to announce here today that we plan to create a Sustainable Business for Africa platform to better understand the bottlenecks and obstacles that African and European businesses face to invest in Africa at both the local, sectoral, specific and strategic levels. With the help of you in the business community, we can better address the key constraints to investments whether that is legal or, uh, or a judicial certainty, fair rules for open competition, anti-corruption, 
skills, infrastructure, or value chains, for example. If businesses can help us better understand the market conditions, we can better design and prioritize our actions and in turn create a, vi a virtuous circle to improve the opportunities for investments. I would like to formally launch the Sustainable Business for Africa platform at the Africa-EU Summit in November and to have the new external investment plan endorsed by the African Union at the same time. From today and, uh, and in the run-up to November, we want to hear what you think about these two new proposals, therefore, and whether there are things we can do to ensure they function even more effectively. Because, in short and in conclusion, I think we all agree that business as usual is not an option. In order to respond to the challenges and opportunities which our two continents face, we need a stronger, more focused and political partnership, a true partnership of equals, with a clear vision, high ambition and focus on results. Africa and Europe both have much to gain from increasing our political and economic ties even further. But more importantly, uh, so uh, do our business, citizens and young people in particular. I look forward very much to hearing the outcome of your fruitful discussions today and let's keep the conversation as we look to a successful outcome or in Abidjan. Thank you very much and uh, uh, I really would like to have this forum as a, as a leading, guiding uh, forum to our business cooperation between Africa and the uh, European Union. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Good speech. Thank you. Thank you very much there to the Commissioner. Now, next I invite on the stage a uh, gentleman from Ghana and a wordsmith, uh, Mr. Kwezi Kwarti, the Deputy Chairman of the African Union. Good morning, everybody. Your, your Excellencies, uh, colleagues, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I bring you fraternal greetings from the African Union Commission, from our chair, Mr. Musa Faki Mohammed, and from all of us in Africa. Of course, we need to thank our European Commission for the warm hospitality. In spite of a slightly chilly weather, we still feel the warmth here, and we appreciate it. Africa, always a paradox, they say, is experiencing unprecedented economic growth, or so we're told. Fundamental change, we're told, is on the horizon. With the growing realization of the potential of the private sector to engage in transformational development. Relations between Africa and Europe come a long way. And Africa remains a paradox, as they say, or as Church would have put it, an enigma wrapped in a conundrum. Poverty within unspeakable wealth. But how did we get there? Today's forum, in my view, gives us yet another opportunity to take stock of previous AU-EU strategy forums, how to strengthen our network, and how to develop a, a vibrant private sector as the engine of growth. But that means we must engage each other more closely in more intense interrogation and conversation. The Agenda 2063 of the African Union is a framework which advocates all-inclusive growth. Not growth for the rich or for the poor, growth for everybody. And our vision is to build a prosperous, 
integrated, united Africa at peace with itself and with the world. If we're able to do that, we can avoid the spectacle of thousands of frustrated youth walking across the Sahara at the mercy of all kinds of people floating on the Mediterranean in unsafe crafts and dying and having to be rescued and all that. It is a truly disheartening sight. We don't want to see too many of that anymore. So our theme is to harness the demographic dividend of our youth. But what do we mean by that? We talk about decent job creation. We talk about agribusiness. We talk about sustainable energy. We talk about digitization. How do you do all that without education? So the theme for this year, deriving from the major theme of harnessing demographic youth, the demographic dividend is education, education, education. We would like to see every African child in school by the year 2020. It might seem crazy, we might look like dreamers, but we have John Lennon on our side. It's important to dream, and if your dream does not seem impossible to you, then you're not dreaming enough then probably you've woken up. And when you realize your dream, you probably lost it. So for us, the task of government is to provide the conditions, security, good governance, democracy, rule of law. But what is most critical for us is education, 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 technical skills, managerial skills, numeracy, literacy. You want to see a numerate and a literate Africa, and it's not impossible. We've seen China pull out billions of people out of poverty. How did they begin? They began with a China in which everybody is educated, and as you increase your level of education, everything deepens, your ambitions drive you further forward. So what we're saying to European business is that we are excited by a renewed interest in Africa, though occasionally we wonder how come all of a sudden Africa, which to President Sarkozy was a continent which never contributed anything to culture and knowledge, to the economist, the hopeless continent, to a Roman consul out of Africa, always something new. For us, it is our home, our precious home. The Africa where the sun shines brightest still managed to be called the dark continent. We need to reappraise all our thinking about Africa. And if we begin to focus properly in the long term, that is education. In the short term, you may do some other things like uh, infrastructure, railroad, and all that. But to create human capital, that is the key for Africa. And what do I mean by capital? Capital is value which creates value. And it's only education. It's only an educated population. Education of women and children, adults, continue education. That's what we're going to see, the flowering of African culture. If you're able to do that, supported by good governance and rule of law, everything is ready to accept technology and capital from Europe. And then our collaboration will begin to have meaning. And you have Africans moving across a wide continent freely without borders. And if we are talking about borders today, where did the borders come from? A group of gentlemen got themselves together to avoid war in Europe, divided Africa up like a piece of cake. And the business of the African Union is slowly trying to disentangle the knots 
that Africa has been tied into. If we're able to do that, we have free flow of goods, capital, and people. You can have an Africa where European business will have a larger economic space and the productive energies of the people will be liberated. And you don't have many of us trying to cross the Sahara seeking a non-existent El Dorado in Europe. So my dear friends, this is my message to you. Help us put our act together, integrate the continent which was disintegrated from Europe, if truth be told. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much, the uh, Vice Chairman of the African Union. And uh, now we're going to hear from Ambrose Foyole, the Vice President of the European Investment Bank. Right, okay. So we're going to move on now to uh, Pierre Gillan, the Vice President of the African Development Bank, Private Sector, Infrastructure and Industrialization. Do take the stage. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here this morning uh, in this important forum. I'm really uh, happy to be here to discuss partnership between the EU, ACP countries and African institutions. For the African Development Bank, private sector is an important area and a growing area. Uh, the continent itself is growing. We have been emphasizing of late the slowdown in the growth, but let's not forget that seven of the fastest, uh, of the 10 fastest growing countries in the world are in Africa, and that while GDP growth may have been only about 2.2% in 16, 3.4% in 15, it was over 5% for over a decade. And so, and it's uh, expected to pick up again uh, this year and next to 3.4 and 4.3% respectively. So it's a, it's a continent of growth and opportunity, an emerging continent par excellence, one where lots of business is to be done by Africans with their international partners. One of the consequences of this rapid growth that we've seen over the past 15 years is also the development of a growing middle class who says growing middle class also says growing purchasing power, growing ability to produce for the domestic market and not just for export. And so one whole strand in private sector development uh, and investment in Africa these days is to stimulate production for this growing domestic market that can be served and for which products could be manufactured locally that meet local needs better and that also provide employment opportunities in the home market. But to achieve a really uh, attractive market, Africa will need to open up more. And uh, the Commissioner uh, referred to it before, we need to contribute to creating these larger markets that will make investment in one African countries also investment in the continent as a whole. That, to me, remains a priority. But let me go back to what we do at the African Development Bank. Uh, we've lent about 13 billion euros uh, over the past 15 years in support of the private sector directly. Uh, the share of our private sector work was only about 8% in 2006, and it has reached now 31% this year. So it's a fast growing share of our business, about 3 billion euros for uh, this year alone. Uh, so just to remind you, we are an African institution, we lend to government and we lend to private sector, about 30% of our lending, as I just said. Uh, we do also a lot of co-finding, almost everything we do, we do in partnership with others, including many of you in this room, and that includes uh, EIB, CDC, Proparco, KFW, DEG, uh, but also regional development banks like TDB or West African Bank for Develop or Development Bank. So we are here to invest in African businesses, but also to invest with governments in improving the investment climate, the business climate that is going to make it more attractive to do business in Africa. Uh, just this last month, I had the opportunity to visit two of the projects that, uh, that we have fined, and I just uh, want to say a word about it. One is Durba Cement in Ethiopia, which is not the country that has been best known for uh, wild private sector development. That investment by a private company, supported by us and, and other uh, development partners, has had a tremendous impact 
cement prices following the opening of the factory dropped by 75%, and all of that also resulted in significant savings in foreign exchange, which is constrained in Ethiopia, as in many other developing countries. In addition to that, it helped develop the region it is in, uh, implanted in and created over 700 uh, long-term jobs. The other project I visited a few weeks ago was the Nakala Corridor in Mozambique. It's an amazing achievement. A private company invested close to $10 billion to create, to develop a mine and create a 912 kilometer railway, a third of which was a brand new greenfield, the rest was rehabilitation, uh, and develop a port. And so we are part of the financing of that effort. That in itself will help unlock Malawi, which as you know is a uh, landlocked developing country, but also some parts of Mozambique that had been quite isolated. And that investment was done by private sector, so astonishing accomplishment where the international community, including ourselves, have played a supporting role. We also have our Africa SME program that was launched in 2013 and has uh, provided so far over 114 million euros. We also launched the African Guarantee Fund for small and medium enterprise that uh, provides much needed guarantees to that segment that was jointly with uh, the Danish and Spanish uh, development agencies. And since 2012, uh, when the AGF was launched, uh, they have helped find access to over 1,300 SMEs and created 11,000 additional, additional jobs. So lots of these mechanisms can have a tremendous impact on the life of people. As you may know, uh, also the African Development Bank has launched a major uh, initiative called the High Fives, and it means that these are top five priorities for development. And those priorities are meant to catalyze and focus our energy on power and light up Africa, feed Africa, industrialize Africa, integrate Africa, and improve the quality of life of Africans. These are our five core priorities, and all our energies are focused on that. And with a purpose to close the energy gap, to uh, kind of move Africa from being a net importer of food to be self-sufficient and an exporter later on, to diversify economies from uh, heavy reliance on, on uh, primary commodities to additional value addition, and to get a, to also unlock landlocked small and fragmented small markets into regional uh, integrated ones. So that's our high fives, what really guides our action as a development bank. But to achieve all these uh, targets, to achieve our high fives, the private sector is absolutely critical and much more remains done to uh, really tap into its energy and unleash its power. And first, lots remains to be done by governments, by African governments. And uh, I'd just like to echo one thing, an initiative that many of us launched about 10 years ago. You may have heard of the Investment Climate Facility for Africa, which was launched around 2006, to help African governments improve their investment climate. The idea at the time, 10 years ago, was that it would be a temporary institution that at its end of its term would be mainstreamed into an African institution to build up capacity within Africa, within African institution. ICF did its job, lasted for 10 years, was wound up as planned, but was not mainstreamed into an African institution, which I think is a major missed opportunity. And we at the African Development Bank stand ready to take up the torch and to work with partners who would be keen to help us support this effort uh, moving forward. So that's for the enabling environment. A lot remains to be done, many areas, uh, and one of my priority areas is definitely going to be to help translate lots of trade agreements and protocols into trade reality and opportunities for businesses to import, export, and do business across African borders. But let me move to a second area that uh, we want to emphasize moving forward, and it's kind of new financial instruments. You've heard about it already today. You'll hear more about it. Uh, and I'll focus more specifically on opportunities for blended finance. Uh, Africa is home to about 20 fragile countries, fragile situations, countries in, transi in transition. You can pick the word you want, uh, and that's 20 out of 54. It's a large number of countries, and it's countries where, by definition, the risk of doing business is higher than in other countries. That's almost, by definition, what these countries are. 
Uh, if you look at, we, at what we at the African Development Bank do in terms of uh, investing in private company in these uh, fragile environments, only 4% of our investments go to these companies, 4%. Uh, to, to companies in these 20 countries. If you take Côte d'Ivoire and Madagascar, which are on that list of 20 countries, uh, out of the equation, that leaves 2%. 2% of our private investment go to the remaining 18 fragile countries. So we need help. We need help to tackle the risk, whether it's by first loss guarantee or other blended firing schemes. We are very keen to scale up our investment in these environments, in these countries. Private sector is critical to create jobs and opportunities, and not, uh, nowhere is that as important as in uh, fragile countries. Second group where we need some blended finance and support, and you heard me mention it already before, it's uh, one of uh, my personal priority areas, is uh, landlocked developing countries. Uh, Africa counts 16 of them. 16 countries have the double, quote-unquote, handicapped of being both developing and landlocked, being dependent on other countries to connect, to grow, and to become part, uh, an integral part of the global economy. There again, blended finance instruments can help kind of create this connectivity both on the landlocked country and on the coastal country they depend on. Third area where we need some blending support is in support of innovation, startups, and young entrepreneurs. And there I'm pleased to inform you that uh, jointly with the uh, European Commission, ACP countries, and EIB, uh, we are about to launch a new fund called Boost Africa. We hope that this can fund can be launched before the end of the year. And what this fund will do, and which will rely on a junior tranche that funded by uh, the EU, uh, this uh, fund would then uh, finance venture capital uh, uh, funds in specific African countries and support a local ecosystem of entrepreneurship and development. And finally, fourth area where we will need support in terms of blending and concessional support is increasing access to local currency financing. Most of us in the development business, we have foreign exchange, we lend in uh, euro, dollars, what have you, and uh, it's very difficult for SMEs in particular in African markets to take that foreign exchange risk. So we need to come up of, with mechanisms to de-risk that and to make increased local currency currency financing available to many of these uh, SMEs. That's for the blended finance instruments. Let me now move to another key part of our agenda, which again fits in this integrating Africa overall uh, goal. When you look at what we do in the transport and ICT areas, for example, a big chunk of that is to connect countries to one another and to regional markets. For example, the Mombasa-Nairobi-Addis corridor, we've invested over one billion in it, and so more of these efforts are needed, not just to finance the infrastructure, but also to ensure that once the infrastructure is financed, that the services that run over it, whether it is border and custom services, whether it is trucking and logistics services, are competitive and uh, can really deliver the goods at the fastest and cheapest way uh, possible. But I, I would not want to conclude my remarks here in Brussels at the Africa EU Business Forum without highlighting what Africa can also learn from Europe. Because we talk a lot about South-South cooperation, which is excellent. I was in India last week and had made some deals with Indian uh, governments and companies to support African investment and initiatives. But there's a lot to be learned in Africa from the, Afri uh, from the European integration experience. And, what, what Europe has achieved over the past uh, 60 years or so is nothing short of remarkable. We had lots of small scattered markets, quite suboptimal, too small to do business in at scale, too small to compete internationally. Well, you know, uh, whatever you may think about the European project, it has brought tremendous progress, it has pr brought tremendous opportunity, and it has done by stitching different national governments together in kind of a gradual process. I, I really believe that Africa has a lot to learn from that European experience. Look at the open skies we benefit from here in Europe, and look at the implementation of the Yamoussoukro decision in Africa. I mean, 
air transport in Africa is problematic, largely because the market doesn't work, air traffic rights are not granted, there's not enough competition, and there's no mechanism to really bring it together. So we're keen to work with our African partners, including AFCAC, but also to draw on the experience of the EU. I've talked a lot about integrating markets. The experience of the EU in creating single markets is just powerful and formidable. The experience of putting up mechanisms such as competition policy or unique identity schemes to help make these markets really integrated is equally important. Trans-European networks, well, PDAC can learn a lot from trans-European networks. So I think that when we look at the EU-Africa partnership, we also need to look at how African regional integration can benefit from the tremendous track record that Europe has achieved in integrating its own markets. So, to conclude, I'd like to reaffirm that the African Development Bank is your part partner in Africa's development. We are an African institution with non-regional members, many from the EU. We are a development bank. We have invested in a broad, ex broad ecosystem of regional development finance institutions in which we are shareholders and lenders like Afrexim Bank, ATI, TDB, like about a dozen of them. And we also lend to the public sector as well as the private sector, and we lend for policy reform as well as for specific investments. Our high five priority areas cannot be achieved without strong investment by African governments, by the private sector, and by development partners such as the EU. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Pierre Guillain of the African Development Bank. Now, uh, we're going to our first uh, panel discussion, particularly I'm looking forward to this morning. Um, one thing I can say, next month I would have been a journalist for 36 years. Of those, I spent 23 years reporting from Africa from more than 20 countries. And I can tell you, as a business journalist on the continent, these are exciting times to be alive in, in the African continent. But they're also very frightening times to be alive in as well. Um, the other day, I um, marched with, as a journalist with 120,000 people on the seat of government in South Africa. And if ever you want to see the face of angry youth on this continent, you should have been with me that day. And I can tell you something now, that unless we create jobs and create investment in this continent, I think the price that all of us who live and work there are going to pay is going to be a very, very heavy one. So um, just to move on to our first discussion, and I'll start inviting our guests up onto the stage starting with Rebecca Stroymeyer, the founder of eLearning Africa. Do come and join me. Anyway. They'll, put, they'll, they'll, <laughs> they'll direct you. Rebecca, she's, uh, her job is to connect uh, entrepreneurs with um, capital, and we'll be talking a lot more about that. Can I uh, also invite Mr. Pierre Gattaz, the president of MEDEF, the French business Confederation, thank you very much for joining us. Hello. Bonjour. And um, also Mr. Vimal Shah, an entrepreneur <laughs> who's just getting hooked up over there from uh, Kenya, Nairobi. And, uh, well, shall I say one of our continent's more successful entrepreneurs and has a very, very hardworking family and I'm sure lots and lots of uh, views on exactly what's going to happen in investment in this continent. Do welcome, Bimal Shah. Mm. Thank you. Okay, well, if you don't mind, I shall stay up here. And uh, just to start off with, if I can go from uh, left to right here, just a, a brief uh, mention, if you could, do just your reaction of what the European Union is trying to achieve here with investment in Africa. What's your initial reaction to it, sir? Well, that's a very important uh, subject for Europe and for the world. I think, uh, again, Africa is going to go, to go from 1 billion inhabitants to 2 billion in uh, 30 years. So we have to help our African friends and partners to develop and especially to create jobs. 
I think the most important thing is to create uh, jobs locally. So uh, this is very interesting and very good that uh, Europe can uh, build, rebuild uh, a priority, a project, uh, uh, which would be you know, a 30 years project. But we absolutely need, uh, they have to integrate the business people that we represent, because without the business people, nothing will happen. Because we are in the actions, we are in concrete actions, and this is a basic. Uh, if you look at the past, we have been talking, talking, talking. Now we need actions, actions, and actions. Rebecca, what's your view? Europe and Africa are independent, interdependent, and I think it's crucial. It's the only way forward, especially with the way the world is changing at the moment. I think it's in both continents' interest to work very closely together. It's the only way forward. Dima, on the inside, looking out, what's your view of this investment uh, initiative? I think it's uh, fantastic. Every investment initiative is very well welcome. I think um, Africa needs a lot more investment. Um, if you look at demand, the demand side is being created out there just by the demographics. Uh, when you look at, when you talk about Pierre, uh, 1 billion people going to become 2 billion, 2.4 billion. I think the demand is going to be there. So food, clothing, shelter, name it, logistics, the whole lot. Um, the land mass, if you look at the land mass, it's quite big anyway. And uh, when we talk about a billion people there, uh, becoming 2 billion, it's going to be bigger than India, China, or anywhere else. Mm. And that's why the demand side is getting stronger. The key issue is the supply side. And that's why I'm saying we've got to create a supply side, the supply side for everything, which is where the opportunity lies. And I think that's the opportunity that either the EU or anybody else looking at it and saying, we can help. However, I think smart partnerships, strong partnerships need to be created out there. And I think a lot of leadership out there is actually looking for this. So this is probably the right time when things are really moving. People want to move it. Leaders want to do it. However, we have a big problem in Africa, and that is capital formation. Capital formation is a big um, missing action sort of thing. And I think that's where it's available out here. So you've got the supply side, you've got the know-how, we've got the demand side. So I think this is where we need to sort of bring it together and say, fine, there is a match here. OK. Uh, Mr. Gattaz, if I could ask you one question on home territory. I mean, you've just had a change of administration in France, a new president. What do you think France's uh, outlook towards Africa is likely to be with the new administration? Uh, France has a long history with Africa, and I think we uh, should come back to a new world now, to see the future, not the past. Uh, we should forget the past, I would say, and see the next 30 years again. That means seeing the future with our African partners without arrogance, first of all. It's a win-win. We have to build a win-win partnership. That means we have to sell, to uh, technologies, to uh, put local jobs, of course. But we have to learn from our, the African entrepreneur. I've met a lot of entrepreneurs from Africa. They are excellent. They are very good. The young entrepreneurs are excellent in digital. For instance, in Kenya, you've got applications on mobiles for payments, which are very simple, but very outstanding, extraordinary technologies. So I think we have to build these win-win partnerships in the next 30 years, saying we are going to get from you and, we are going, and you are going to get from us, but that's going to be balanced. And I'm sure that if we go into that direction without saying, I know everything, I'm going to learn you, to teach you, and you're going to buy my products, this is it. This is not good. Mm. If you say, together, we are going to, to build a new world, uh, and the, the new relationship between Europe and Africa, because you, we need growth, you need, you need growth. We need jobs, but you need jobs. And again, together, we can build a good future. And I think France has maybe a role to play, because as you know, 40% of the Africans speak French. We have a long story. So we could be, we, we could be a kind of open gate uh, from Europe to Africa. Not the only one, of course. Again, no arrogance. But just because we have old history and old relationships that we can use to, to rebuild the future. Rebecca, I mean, Mr. Gattaz mentioned not five minutes ago, things, time is the time for action. What difference do you think this uh, investment initiative could make to the lives of the entrepreneurs that you, you deal with in the African continent? 
a, a huge difference. I think if, if it's recognized, and I think now it has slowly over the last few years, it's been recognized, the relevance of, 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 of the formation of new businesses, especially SMEs and new um, entrepreneurs create SMEs and then strengthen the community. So I think it's, it's huge. What is relevant, though, is how fast it takes. Often these kind of investment um, programs are very, can be very bureaucratic, can take a long time. By that time, all creativity is lost and the idea is sort of, you know, put back to bed. So I think that's also crucial as well as speeding up the process, making it simple, cutting the bureaucracy as far as possible and, and um, finding a, a proper set of, of guidelines, how one works to make it happen. So, Vimal, that's a question I put to you. I mean, you and I know scores of uh, African business people on the continent. The first question they're going to ask when we go back is, oh, that sounds great. When? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think the time is now. I think the two things here, it's all welcome. The problem is that Africa is not waiting for somebody uh, called Europe to come and sort itself out. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is something that I would rather say it here. It's not going to wait. We have demand. We need to service it. It will be met by somebody from somewhere. If not Europe, it'll be China, it'll be India, it'll be Brazil, it'll be, uh, you know, America. So everybody's trying to get a piece of the action. The question is this analysis paralysis that we have a lot of times about, oh, we don't trust this, we don't trust that. It's changing. The time is now, and I think a lot of leadership, if you see leadership changes across, I mean, it's happened in the U.S., it's happened in the U.K., Leadership changes are happening everywhere. In Africa, there's a leadership ethos right now that's saying, let's make a move, let's make it happen. Now, there is impatience there, and I think this is where we need to really say, fine, let's get on with it. However, partnering with them, partnering and making sure that we have thought leadership as, as far as it's concerned, also giving them direction. Dictating and saying, we're rich, you're poor, is going to be a thing of the past. Because we're saying, I look at you from a poor, a rich man's eyes, you're poor. I think aid is not important. It's not aid which gives us AIDS. By, by AIDS, I mean always in debt syndrome. And we're always becoming like a begging bowl. And I think that's what Africa must cease to be doing and saying, here's a begging bowl, give us some aid, give us some help here. I think it's better to say, here's an opportunity. There's an opportunity to do business. There's an opportunity to improve the lives of people. Come and make a difference. You really want to make a difference? Come out and make it. And I think we've got to remove this whole word called CSR, which is cosmetic social responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to make it more SRC, socially responsible corporates, social, socially responsible citizens, and countries. In that manner, the time right now is happening. There are 54 countries in Africa, and I think we've got to say this very clearly. And there are some that are leading, some that are laggards. And I think that's where a lot of us start branding Africa and saying, oh yeah, it's poor, it's finished, because one country. I mean, like Kenya is compared with Somalia, and that's always the case. And say, fine, it's, it's, not, it's not really going to happen. Same thing with Ivory Coast, it's been compared with, with other, other countries in West Africa. We've got to isolate countries and say, fine, which are the ones that are leading, which are the ones that are compliant, make them role models, make them examples of saying, here is what we did, we made a difference, the rest will follow. Can I just say as a fellow African resident here, here, before we carry on, but um, <laughs> coming back to you, Mr. Gattaz, I mean, one of the, the key points of this whole thing is job creation, which... I mean, the country I live in is 25% unemployment alone. Uh, it's a key thing, but uh, a lot of uh, talk was yesterday about uh, sustainable jobs and how we must have jobs for the future. I can tell you, most of the politicians that I know in the continent will say, we want numbers, we want thousands now. We want thousands for the, before the next election. How is business going to deal with that through this scheme? Well, I think, first of all, the business people... Um, well, Africa needs jobs and Africa needs SMEs. So we need to have our SMEs, European SMEs, go into Africa because most of the time it's large companies, big companies, Bolloré, Total, and so on. So we need to have the SMEs going there. To, go to, to, to motivate the SMEs to go and, and, and create jobs, uh, first of all, from the European perspective, we need a trust environment, business-friendly environment. This is true for Europe. If you have the margin, you can go to Africa. If you don't have the margin, you don't go. You don't globalize, you don't export. You just you know, stay at home and wait. Mm. If the, we need a business environment which is, uh, which is good in Africa too. That means uh, no bureaucracy, uh, things uh, easy to deal with, and business people talking with business people. So I think it's very important to see that the SMEs can talk with SMEs, local SMEs, and then they can partners, because, and, and they do business, and they do projects. Uh, then you have to, to, to guarantee the financing, because I think finance is a key stone too. 
There's trust, their business friendly environment in Europe and in Africa, and finance. Because sometimes you have billions of euros, you know, which are in the clouds. And in your, if you are a SME, you want to export, you want to do things, you don't see the billions. And so we need absolutely to make these billions going into the capillarity of the SMEs. Not staying, you know, in the government, in a country, in a big infrastructures, but going into the capillarity of the SMEs. Because the SMEs will need guarantee of payments, they will need some security. So this is the most important thing, I think, to be sure that the SMEs from Europe will go and help creation of jobs locally. And then, of course, you have the education. Education is a keystone, too, after the business-friendly environment, trust, uh, guarantee of finance, and so on. Education means you can create long-lasting jobs. And this is a part of responsibility between the, the, the companies themselves, who have to train their uh, colleagues and, and salaries and employees all over their life, because mutations are everywhere, digital is disrupting everything. So we need to teach to train our people all lifelong. And the countries, the governments must do that too. So education is something that we have to build and, uh, in a sustainable way in order to, to, to be sure that the companies which will create locally jobs uh, will, will, will be able to, to climb into the added value. Because what I look in, in, in Africa, they have quite it's, uh, um, amazing uh, raw materials and you know, uh, minerals, gold, everything. You have everything in the, in the grounds, agriculture. But the prime is to create jobs, we need to increase in the added value. The jobs must go uh, in the, the upper side of, of the chain. So that's another uh, challenge to do, is to be sure that the people will not stay in the farms, in the, in the, in the ground, but will become technicians, engineers, searchers. And in that case, you can develop sustainable companies, sustainable technologies, sustainable jobs locally. So Rebecca, if I could just ask you, I mean, at Forbes Africa, we believe the government coffers of Africa are empty. They're not going to create jobs for the youth that's coming up. From what you're seeing on the ground with entrepreneurs, how likely is it? Because often, as these SMMEs you're talking about, they can be the most vulnerable and the most prone to fail in the continent, it has to be said. How likely is it that they can create uh, the jobs that the continent needs? The SME, the, 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 the new ed techs or the government itself? No, no. Uh, the no they, uh, they, they, they can. Of course, they can. I mean, the. the um, I'm, I come from an SME. I started my. my I started at a time when the word startup didn't exist, and uh, I didn't get all the favourable conditions that you get as a startup. But ba basically, I think that is the backbone. But it's a question of of creating a favourable environment. It's also a big question of education. That's also my background. My, where I work is in ed tech startups, and and it's about the skills. So, um, and it's finding skilled people. I think a lot of people, a lot of um, the, the, the void in, in the labor market is not because there are no jobs. There are plenty of jobs, but there are a lot of unskilled people, and that's the crucial thing. So, I, I personally think as long as um, banks are supportive, as long as the government and the policymakers see the relevance of startups. But if I could just jump in there, yeah. I mean, I can give you a score of stories. Yeah. A lot of SMMEs, when they go to the banks, they get laughed at. Exactly. People yeah. say, I'm sorry, yes. we're not going to give you a penny. Yeah. We don't trust you. I mean, yeah. well, that's why I think education is hugely important on all levels, re-education on all levels, and understanding what makes growth. So I think it's really it's about um, the multi-stakeholder uh, partnerships, and that all all players in, in in the arena understand how relevant it is to bring something forward. It's a change of mindset. But you know, we, we we talk a lot about Africa. Look at Europe. We have a huge problem with 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 the same, and we have also a problem on the, in, in, the, in the sense of what are the future of jobs? That's changing very very rapidly with the demographics. Uh, I think I'll probably have to work until I'm 90. And, um, and so I think uh, that this, this, this uh, subject is relevant for every single continent, uh, and not just for Africa, but it's about re-changing re one's mindset and really having banks take more, uh, taking more risks. Vimo is a highly experienced businessman operating in Africa. Where would you be directing the investment from outside to create jobs, sustainable jobs, that is? I think there's, there's many avenues right now. Every single challenge you name, and a lot of people talk about this challenge, there's a challenge, there's a challenge. Every single challenge in Africa is an opportunity for jobs. Absolutely there. If we have potholes on the road, you can have road making machinery. You can actually do a lot more there in terms of everything. Telecoms, agribusness. Uh, we, 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 we've been selling, sorry to say that we've been selling cotton to the world and saying, fine, make the shirts. Why don't we sell the shirts? Make the shirts, brand them, and then send them off overseas. We create a lot of jobs there. Um, talk about your, your co cocoa, right? We can make, convert it into chocolates and send it off across as Ladrach or even Lint or whatever and make it across. Get more jobs created out there. Coffee, the same thing. 
When we talk about that, there is tourism. There's immense amount of tourism possible out there. So jobs can be created. So if you've got funds and you say, fine, we want to direct this, uh, like you said, uh, Chris, I think a young entrepreneur going to a bank is asked for collateral. You got collateral, you got security, you got a house or something, we'll take it. We all, all the banks over there are doing asset-backed financing. If you got an asset, we're going to finance it. However, in the West here, you can get money based on a business plan to say, fine, here's a business plan, I'll give you working capital, and the money is flowing. The trust Im is important. I think this is where we got to re-look uh, re at what is the trust levels, number one. Number two, uh, in the banking world, the risk perception. All the people who map risk in Africa, they put it into a red color and say, this is hot risk, it is high risk, very risky. I come from there, I'm born there, I'm brought up there, and I'm going to die there. I think it's important to say we don't see risk from, the, from a local footing. However, the perception of a lot of Western banks is still it's too risky, number one. Number two, um, collateral. Number three, um, working capital is not available freely. I think that Africa has got to get together with its bank, and I think the African Development Bank should also look at this and say, fine, create one different rule there for, for a lot of local young entrepreneurs to get financing based on you know, what you get out here on working capital. Number two, I think important thing is that um, a lot of the Western banks operate there, and they're all controlled now by OECD or by rules which are were applicable everywhere in the world. And I think Africans are not going to get any financing anymore. Our cost of financing goes up. We pay about 7 to 14 percent in dollar terms or euro terms in, in Africa to get borrowing in, 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 in foreign currency. Local currency is about 10 to 14 percent. To some places, it's 20 percent per annum. Now, based on that, the expectations of everyone is, oh, if I'm paying 20 percent interest rate, my margin has got to be 30, 40 percent. So everything is going up in costs including the cost of infrastructure, the cost of leasing. In fact, leasing is a big business out there which one could start doing. So there's a lot of capital equipment, and I think Europe makes a lot of capital equipment. If we start those leasing businesses out there, there'd be a lot of opportunities. So if you've got money and you want to invest it, I think a lot more equipment being available out there. If you go out here, there's logistics areas where you've got lots of trucks waiting to say, fine, you can hire me. In Africa, no, you've got to buy a truck, you've got to start doing all that stuff. So I think there's so many opportunities. I mean, I could keep on mm -hmm. naming them. Manufacturing, tourism, uh, agribusiness, um, even, even infrastructure. One thing I, I just need to raise with you, uh, Mr. Qatar, see what you think. I mean, one of the previous speakers said that there was this criteria of fragile states, so-called fragile states. It seems to me that could be a bit of a political minefield for this initiative because just the other week I was at the World Economic Forum in Durban, South Africa with uh, President Robert Mugabe and he was asked if he thought he lived in a fragile state and he said, in fact, I don't. I think that if you want to call a fragile state anything, call the United States a fragile state. Um, I'm just wondering politically, you're going to come and say, listen, you're a fragile state, we want to help you. You might get a very strange reaction from some of the politicians on the continent. Well, I think that, you know, if, uh, again, uh, every state can be fragile at a time. Uh, so the idea is, th I, th I really strongly believe that economy is a rock. So if uh, you have a, a strong economy, which is with uh, SMEs and, you know, you, you can build a, a more, pl a more uh, a less fragile state. Uh, so, uh, because the economy is there, and when the politicians, you know, are moving from the extreme right to extreme left, the SMEs are here, the jobs are here, the economy is working. So this is why it's so important that to develop this economy and to develop uh, these, these jobs, uh, because it's, it's, uh, it's the part of uh, reinforcing, uh, I think, the, 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 the sustainability of the state itself. So economy is a key. And uh, just one more point that we speak about SMEs, I would like to emphasize on entrepreneurship too. And in MEDEF, uh, French Business Association, we develop a lot uh, of uh, concrete actions again to develop entrepreneurships locally. I know that uh, there's a Tony Elumelu Foundation in Kenya, uh, in, uh, in Lagos, by the way, and uh, this, uh, um, uh, this person is uh, very brilliant to, to, to help local African entrepreneurs to develop their business. And I think this is another way to uh, recreate jobs, not only SMEs, not only large companies, uh, but also developing this entrepreneurship is helping the people to make the startups. And in Nairobi, 20th of November, uh, in six months, we are going to have the first startup meetings in Africa uh, with MEDEF and uh, an association that we created for that. You know that these guys can find advisors, finance, uh, friends, partners, 
to develop their own uh, business. And the more entrepreneur we'll have in Africa, the better it will be. So Rebecca, this idea of being an entrepreneur in Africa, I mean, I travel a lot on the continent and uh, I meet a lot of uh, young entrepreneurs coming up. I can tell you 99 out of 100 who make it, their parents have said to them, listen, why don't you get a proper job, be a teacher, why don't you go work for the government, get something that gives you a regular paycheck. How long do you think it's gonna to take to change that mindset that being an entrepreneur, it's too risky and it's not like, in quotes, a proper job? Depends on the people, really. It depends, you know, I think a lot of people, ha ha either you're an entrepreneur or you're not. Often it's a, an early, early education thing. I, you know, people talk about teaching entrepreneurship at university. I think either you, you learn it early and it's, um, it, it's a character trait even. Um, you'll always have your parents arguing with you with what you want to do and you'll always have people trying to put things, making it difficult. It's going to be a slow process. Well, not necessarily. I think it's, it's you know, what, one thing about Africa, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, there's so much opportunity. There's so many ideas. I mean, if I were in my 20s and I was going to start a new business, I'd go there because there's so many things you can do. It's not saturated there. And it's just a question of, 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 of creati creativity. I think the most important thing really is, is teaching people and educating people from an early, early age to think differently, to have, especially in the soft skills area. So I think critical thinking is one thing, um, emotional intelligence, creativity, and, uh, and then also financial literacy is another thing, something I never learned at, at uh, you know, I think I'm learning it now. Um, but those things to understand um, and, to, and to take risks. And then the world's your oyster, really. Just before you come in, Bimal, you're, you're in Nairobi, one of the entrepreneurial capitals of Africa. Um, what are you seeing from the young people coming up? Uh, do you think that uh, this kind of uh, investment initiative is going to be fertile, do you think, amongst the youngsters you're seeing? I think uh, very, very clearly there's lots of youngsters, and I, I'm a patron of, of quite a few of these guys. One's called African Garage, and they actually have uh, 25, under 25, under the age of 25 entrepreneurs who they give awards to every year. And you can see that entrepreneurship is, is a lot of it is inbuilt. However, what they lack is a bit of mentoring, a bit of road, uh, you know, sh show them how to, how, to, how to navigate, and also some financial skills, business plans. And I think if that education was imparted to them, straight away you could create all these guys into many, many, many more better things. However, linkage to market is another thing, right? And I think where they actually can produce products or produce the services, the linkage to market is where uh, the linkage is required. So big business needs to sort of say, okay, we will take this, the goods from them and you know, contract them out. So there's a linkage there that could be provided and, and, and a lot more could be done. So when you talk about big business, when you talk about international business, there could be a lot more linkages being provided. However, government probably needs to do a policy change where say, oh, if you're actually supporting 20, 30, 40, 50 entrepreneurs, there could be some sort of incentive, tax incentive or whatever, that changes behavior. Because I think behavior only changes when there are incentives around it and or the disincentives around it. So there is possibility of this uh, you know, initiative becoming right. However, if it's not targeted properly, a lot of times, a lot of international organizations do G2G, you know, government to government or institution to government and expect the government to start sorting themselves out. Uh, I think it's the thing with sovereignty, right, that we will not interfere with your business. But I think private to private, a lot could be done. The private sector entrepreneurs can be promoted. Um, there's a lot of entrepreneurship spirit uh, out there. In the value system, I think, in our countries, uh, getting a government job is prestigious, it's high in the value system, even if the salary is low. It's more that, oh, he's now stable, and they don't like taking risks because we're sort of risk averse. But where we come from, we don't see risk. And I think a lot of African young, young guys are really looking at founding companies. This has come back because of the internet. Now they look at the internet and look at what happened in Silicon Valley, what happened elsewhere, and they're actually talking about the Silicon Savannah out there in Kenya. So the Silicon Savannah will be like a Silicon Valley. Now, what is Silicon Valley? It's a cluster of people with ideas, people with capital, people with, uh, you know, valuation expertise coming together. This is what we need to do out there. So if we can create a cluster out there whereby you've got capital coming there and saying, fine, come make your pitches, and then, of course, make them investable, and then have the round, for round one, round two, round three. Angel investing is non-existent out there. So the one that I saw in Silicon Valley was angel investing and venture capital. We need a lot more of that. But if I recall rightly, the Silicon Valley story you're talking about, Silicon Savannah in Kenya, there was a lot of government money put into training ahead of that. Do you think that this uh, kind of initiative can emulate that kind of uh, training and grassroots work? Yes, I would like to emphasize the fact that uh, the new world that we are living in, 
is full of mutations and digital revolution is a keystone. So it will revolutionize everything. And you can see the youth in all countries, this is true in Europe, in Asia, in the United States, in Africa, and want to become entrepreneur. And in France, for instance, uh, most of the young people wanted to be civil sur surgeons in the administration 20 years ago. Now 60% of them want to become entrepreneur, which is a big cultural move. And this is true in Africa, this is true everywhere in the world, because of revolution, digital economy, mobile. And when you look at the applications again on mobiles in Africa, it's absolutely outstanding. So it's new things, new you know, dreams, that you can, new hopes, that you can bring to the new generation, especially young people. And a good asset of Arca Africa is half of the population uh, are below 25 years old. So you can see this energy, this enthusiasm, and uh, the idea is really to accompany them and to, to try to put clusters in place. That's for absolutely for sure. With finance, with uh, some university, maybe education, and be sure that this guy can take a risk because it's a question of taking risk and then developing the project with the, the advisor, with the people who can help. And I think if we, if we are in this uh, dimension, uh, it should work, yes, uh, in complementary with all what I said about SMEs and uh, what we all say about developing jobs. Rebecca, what's your view on this one? I, I agree. I think, um, I, just, I, the, I think the most crucial thing is really the, the aspect that Mr. Gata has already said is the education. Um, and, and, and that needs to be a very, very strong backbone uh, where the businesses need to be involved, where the government needs to be involved, and, and, and the policy makers in particular, and um, where um, a look at, f at future, uh, future jobs and the future needs, not the old simulating old education models that we copy from, let's say, the West. Not everybody needs a university degree to do a, to a job, to, do a, to do a, uh, have a lifelong job, but I think... Um, a lot of changes needed there in, 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 in that area to, to support um, a, a new, new, new um, potential and new, new creating of new organizations, but also existing organizations finding the skills they need and creating a stronger backbone. But Bimal, I put it to you as an African businessman on the ground. Uh, do you think we really need a, like a university of entrepreneurship and a professorship and a chair of entrepreneurship? I don't know. I mean, some of the best entrepreneurs I've met in Africa, some of them can't even read and write. Some of them um, have a very little education. Some of them don't even touch computers. You know, uh, some of the best guys that I've met. Do you think we really need a college for entrepreneurs in Africa? Um, I don't think we need a college of entrepreneurship. I think we need courses in entrepreneurship where it's required. I think it's business plans. Okay, let's look at it from a bank perspective. What does a bank look at when an entrepreneur goes there? They actually look for a business plan. They look for a, you know, where's your sales, where's your revenue, where's all that stuff. That skill, if we would to teach them to say, fine, this is what a bank expects. This is what the, the insurers expect. This is what you should be doing. And then get all that de-risking model uh, you know, taught to them. Then they'll be formal. However, a lot of entrepreneurs, I mean, there's a traffic problem in Nairobi. I think everybody knows about that problem. And if you see the roads, there's many more entrepreneurs on the road selling you a lot of stuff. They'll sell you cold drinks, they'll sell you goods, they'll sell you, you know, stuff that you need. Were they taught that in school or university? No. It was all acquired on the job. And they're very creative in that sense. However, the skills that are required for becoming bigger and better, I think that's where we could actually have that course. And there's a lot of courses being taught in universities, technical schools already. But yes, we could actually start imparting that knowledge and say, fine, this is what a bank expects, this is what you start becoming. Financial, you know, like they say, you know, for, for people who don't know finance, teach them finance. Teach them all that sort of stuff and entrepreneurship is there. The spirit within is still there. So I think that's, that's there, that comes out. And again, I said yesterday, I think it's necessity is the mother of invention. So when you're pushed to it, um, you really push to the wall, your salary is, is very small, you can't afford it, you're going to go and say, fine, now what do I buy and sell? I'm going to do an arbitrage between buying price and selling price and make some money in the middle. And that, that's happening. Services is now growing even faster than manufacturing. So there's a lot of services. There's home deliveries. There's so much more that's happening. And I think they're learning a lot on internet. A lot of people are acquiring the skills and say, fine, how have, done, how have people done it elsewhere? We can really straight away learn. So emulating that is important. However, it's not one university, one location. I think it's got to be across the board entrepreneurship. Even on YouTube, you know, the how to be entrepreneur, stuff like that, it's proliferating everywhere. If you go into any rally now today, you can see everybody with a smartphone taking videos or taking pictures of the, of the event, and everybody's doing that, even in rural, rural areas. So I think that when I look at them and say, where are they storing this? Where are they going to keep it? But the bandwidth is increasing. And therefore, there's a lot more learning that's happening. 
It's learning by doing, it's not just by university. A lot of good entrepreneurs don't even have degrees. <laughs> and they don't need a degree because they're not looking for jobs. And, and, and a lot of guys that I talk to in terms of university, and I'm also a chancellor of a university, <laughs> and when you go there, you actually tell them, if you got a degree, you are in the 1% bracket in Africa. Do not go and look for a job, go and create more jobs. <laughs> and that's what African uh, graduates need to start doing, is, is, is create jobs out there in Africa. And I think if they start with one job, two jobs, the whole taxi service, I don't know if you know what uh, the taxi service in Kenya is, is amazing. It's competing with Uber. In fact, they've given Uber a run for their money. Uber <laughs> had to drop their prices by 35% to compete with these guys. But if I could put that question to you, uh, Rebecca, as well. Um, I mean, isn't that one of the problems that the world has, not just Africa? I mean, one of our reporters the other day, he's gone off to go and from, he's from Zimbabwe, he's gone off to go and study classics in uh, Canada. And I said to him, what for? And he goes, no, I want to open my mind. I said, well, that's all very good. What are you going to do with it when you come back? And he didn't give me an answer. But isn't it that, that perhaps sometimes we're training a lot of people about uh, literature and history and all these lovely, wonderful things, which I enjoy, but is it not much help when it comes to creating entrepreneurs in no. Africa? No, it's great to have an open mind and to be an educated <laughs> person. And it's wonderful because it means that you'll always want to read and you'll be able to make the connections and, and join the dots in, in all sorts of areas. But a classical education, I think, is a luxury. Not many people can afford that. Um, um, so, yes, new models need to be found, and I think university degrees, there's an inflation of people with university degrees who don't have jobs. Look at Germany, for example, where you have 50-year-old um, professors of biology driving a taxi. Um, you have great conversations with them in the taxi, but I don't <laughs> think it helped them <laughs> elsewhere. So I just think we need to look at, relook at that, and I think the, uh, the advantage also um, that was mentioned about online, learning things online, Google and YouTube are the biggest um, e-learning platforms that exist. You can find anything you want, you can learn to do anything through using YouTube. Um, the most important thing I think is most people, most young people everywhere in the world study for accreditation. They study for the degree. They don't study in order to learn something necessarily. This is a generalization, but they need that degree because that degree is the uh, opener when they have the job interview. And I think we need to change our mindset around that and really look at A, what uh, Mr. Gataz mentions, the lifelong learning aspect. We'll all have to learn, have a lifelong learning scenarios because things change constantly, especially with AI um, and all sorts of other threats and, 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 and developments. So um, I, we need to look at that in a different way. But I also think entrepreneurs are people who are confident. I remember when I went to the bank uh, many years ago, they said that one of the reasons why they agreed to give me the loan was not, I didn't have a business plan, but they said it was personality. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, com it's confidence. But teaching people and teaching young people confidence as well, that's often, we're not, an, and, I, and I, I think I can say that in, in Africa, uh, d different countries have different education models at home. Um, I used to, my, my education model in, in my generation was very authoritarian. It's changed completely in Germany. Your children, you know, constantly, they constantly criticize me, which I'd never dared to do with my parents. But I think the same as in Africa, we have a lot of respect <laughs> for the elders. You have a lot of respect for your parents and you're often taught not to be confident. I think there's certain, I mean, I really think we need to focus on soft skills um, far more in, in, the, in educational institutions and also at home. A lot of that comes from home and who your parents make you to be. And may I, I don't know if it's closing soon, but women and girls is hugely important, <laughs> especially women who have children and who educate their children. So well, that's one, one, key, one key focus. I children criticize their parents not because in I'm Africa a woman. too, I can, I can promise you. <laughs> but uh, anyway, and just um, one, we're coming to the, the end of this discussion now. One last question. I have to ask you, Mr. Gattaz, on behalf of European business. At the World Economic Forum, the uh, finance minister of Germany brought a plane load of top German CEOs to come and see what was happening on the continent. And we all wrote the story, including myself. And I thought about it afterwards. I thought, well, why isn't every single serious business European country sending people out all the time? There's so much going on. And I feel sometimes European business doesn't actually know what's going on on the ground uh, in the continent. Uh, what's your view on that? I'm not sure I understand the question. What I'm saying is, is that every country yeah. in Europe, in my view, should be sending people out and getting more information to about Africa, what's going Africa. on. Africa. Yes, to okay. Africa, yes. Okay. I think sometimes, I mean, for instance, uh, the billionaire Stephen Sudd, he built a um, pharmaceutical manufacturing plant there. No one knew about it. When the Americans came, they were shocked. They said, we can't believe the standards you have. We came expecting a game farm, yes. was his, his exact words. Hmm. And we got this world-class thing. I think sometimes there's a gap in knowledge of actually yeah. what's going on on the ground. Yes. How do you think Europe can close that? Yes, we, we, we should um, absolutely, you're absolutely right. What we do in MEDEF, uh, uh, we have launched an association to create physical contacts, forums, uh, as well as a digital platform in order for people to meet. 
So uh, which we have been doing that in Paris in December, in um, uh, Bamako in January, we are going to do that in Kenya in November. You know that people can meet, so I'm going to be with a delegation of SMEs uh, over there, 100, and progressively I think Europe should do that. I mean, bring delegation of people, SMEs, business people, as well as politicians, but we need concrete actions again, and we need to feel what happens on the field. And in order to help, uh, you're absolutely right. And again, I think that goes not only you know, by symposium or talks or anything, but going in the country, spending there, spending time, building projects are the keystones of the success for the future. So I think this is uh, the, the, the way, uh, well, the business work and this is the way uh, the development should be done. Thank you very much, Mr. Katas. Now, we've just got about one minute left. I want to go along all of you, just a short statement, uh, just closing uh, for the, um, the audience here. Starting with you, Mr. B. Malshaw. I, I think, um, first and foremost, Africa is an opportunity. Um, it is 54 countries, you've got to realize that, and you've got to look at where, where, where to go. But then there's Eastern Africa, Southern Africa, West Africa, North Africa, and Central Africa, and five regions, five regional economic communities. Um, overall, I think um, when people in Europe look at Africa, they look at the GDP figures and say, fine, too small, too small, too small. I think the Belgian GDP is probably equal to the whole African continent. So when they look at those figures, they say insignificant. Therefore, when you talk about big corporates, they say, hang on, not, not significant at all. However, not significant at all today. Look at it from a long-term perspective. Look at it from 10, 20 years from today. And I think that's where the opportunity lies to say long-term. Number two is not having a short-term stint to say, I'm here for a, I'm a CEO for five years. I got to look at this thing and say, fine, take, make some money in five years. It's not going to happen. I think it's going to be longer term. And that's where the Chinese are coming and saying, we want to be here for 20, 30 years, building railways, building a lot of stuff. Opportunity exists. I think it's all about who comes in and who takes it up. But Africa is open for business. I think governments are changing rapidly. And these changes are not reversible. Um, a lot of people try and favor it and say Zimbabwe or whatever. I think stop focusing on those simple countries because they have some leaders who, who will sell by dates over. So I think the question is, where is the next future, the next frontier? I think there's a big frontier coming. Uh, if you don't see the opportunity, you can actually stay in Europe. Rebecca. I'll make it shorter. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, Europe needs Africa, our demographics. We need, we need to work together. We're neighboring continents, and our demographics are not going in a great direction. We need, we need um, jobs. We need to fill jobs here as well. So I think there's only, the only path is together, and it's a great continent to work with. It's a wonderful people. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and much more interesting than working with Africa than with Russia, for example. And I hope there are Russians in the audience, but just in terms of, of, of ease and of um, resp common respect. Mr. Gattaz. I would say that um, uh, Africa is the next big thing, and we absolutely need to have a big program for Europe, for Africa, uh, building it with a win-win balance partnerships, I insist on that, uh, through business, SMEs, for the young people, young Africans, because it's half of the population, through entrepreneurship too, uh, very important, and through uh, a kind of uh, uh, educations. As we said, there's a tacti tacti tactical job with services, so you don't need too much education, you need the sales and so on. And you need, if you want to build planes in Africa within 30 years, you will need apprentices, you will need technicians, you will need engineers, and you need searchers. And I think this is the, the, the two things that we have to be developed is, of course, education, but uh, low education for the people, you know, for tactical jobs, I would say, and uh, high education in any case, plus the fact that the digital revolution will uh, will uh, uh, help to, uh, to create this new type of education on mobiles with the MOOCs and so on. So digital is a uh, in very interesting uh, technology to help Africa to, uh, to develop. Thank you very much, Mr. Pierre Gattaz, the president of MEDEF, uh, Rebecca Storoymeyer, the founder of eLearning Africa, and Mr. Bimal Shah, entrepreneur of Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you very much for lending your ears, and that's it. <laughs>